Hello guys, my name is Krzysztof Zabłocki and uh, I'm an con iOS consultant. I work currently with New York Times mostly. I'm a lead developer at the Times and we just rewrote their main application in Swift with TD and all this stuff. But uh, the other stuff I, you might know me from is I do a lot of open source work. I have a lot of projects like, um, for example, Objective-C Playgrounds or Sorcerer, which I'm going to talk about today. And I also have some indie apps like Foldify, which is Apple Essential. And today I'm going to talk to you about metaprogramming in Swift. Um, more specifically, how to have like a type-safe metaprogramming, which is, there will be a major difference between how we do it in Swift versus how it's done in other languages like Ruby. And I'm going to show you some examples. So let's first start with what exactly is metaprogramming and what's a better definition than what Wikipedia says. I always use it in school, so it has to be right. And in Wikipedia, it says that metaprogramming means that a program can be designed to regenerate, analyze, or transform other programs and even modify itself while running. That's how the definition states that metaprogramming functionality works, but that's not how most people use it. Usually the way we use it is we use it to generate boilerplate code automatically for us. So if you ever use metaprogramming in any of the programming languages, you usually use it to limit the repetitions you have to do, simply said. So let's look at some language that has metaprogramming built in. And one of the best languages, in my opinion, is Ruby, because it's like a huge part of the language. It's built in. It works very well. So let's say you have some code. For the sake of slides, I'm not going to actually show you complicated code. So let's say you have two functions that are very similar. They have some functionality that's basically the same. There might be slight difference between the implementations. But it's a pattern that happens in a lot of projects, regardless of the language. So rather than having repetition and just having like it has the writing word and then it has some something that's variable between different implementations, rather than repeating ourselves with Ruby, you can do something like this. So you can define an array, and for each item in that array, you generate a function automatically that fills all the boilerplate repetitions for you. So if this was a very complex, a co very complex. Um, functionality, you could apply it on multiple types at the same time. There's a lot of benefits in that. So if you have a bug in the, the implementation, if you did it manually, then you have to find all the scenarios where the, that code repetition happened and update it because the bug is everywhere. Versus when you use metaprogramming, you write it once, you test it once. If there is a bug, you fix it in this place and it's fixed everywhere. So a huge benefit, obviously. So. Let's talk more of the reasons why we would want to have metaprogramming. So, especially in Swift, it's a type-safe language. It's very heavily built on types. And uh, if you use, have ever used collections in Swift, you know there's like a little too many types even, I would say. So why would we want metaprogramming in Swift and how does it fit? So if we look at how we work as engineers at Cocoa, either iOS or Mac, it doesn't really matter. Um, our day-to-day -day jobs, right? Let's look at some of the patterns that we have to implement every day. So if you're working on a project and you want to write tests, for example, usually tests are equality assertions. So your type needs to be equitable. equitable. So that's one of the things. When you have equality, you also want hashing. So you can put stuff inside of dictionaries and you can, ha you can uh, calculate the hash value so the collisions can be avoided. Almost every app has some kind of data persistence, whether it's persisting the JSONs, whether it's sending it to the server as a JSON, whether it's saving it to core data, Realm, doesn't really matter. Some kind of data persistence is almost in every application. So you have to parse the JSON that comes from the server because most apps on iOS consuming services and displaying it natively, right? That's like 90% of the apps at least. And uh, if you do TDD or BDD or any kind of testing, you have to deal with the fact that Swift doesn't offer a nice way to use mocking. Like in Objective-C, you could use some of the libraries like OC Mockito or OC Mock, and they would allow you to verify whether the 
stops would get some functions called and you could verify like the interactions between APIs. That's not the case in Swift because there is no automation. So what usually happens is you have protocols in your project and then in your test you have to implement fake objects. So every time you change a protocol you have to go to your test target and update the fake. So there's a lot of repetition. And uh, all of those things separately are very simple tasks, very straightforward. There's, it's not very complicated, right? Everyone here can do it. If you can write Swift, you can do all of those tasks. And the thing is, there's a lot of them. And this is just a couple, couple of them, right? There's a lot more simple tasks that we do every day that are 99% of cases the same code, regardless of the project you're working on or the model type you're working on. For example, equality. What is equality in most projects? It's comparing every single variable and seeing if it's different. If it's different, it's not equal, right? That's 99% of cases. Sometimes you have a scenario when you want to skip a variable because it's computed and stuff like that. But most of the time, that's the algorithm for it. So we keep writing this useless code that just, if it's always the same, it should be automatic, right? That makes no sense for us to waste our time working on this feature, which is not a feature really, right? It's a boilerplate that we need to implement the features, which is what we are interested in. Features help us drive the business goals, help us deliver something for the end user. No one cares how it's implemented underneath. And having to repeat ourselves is very annoying. So with meta programming, we can, we can change the scenario here. It allows us to adhere to do not repeat yourself principle. So if we can describe the boilerplate algorithm like I just did with equality. So if you say for every property, I want to see if the left instance and the right instance values are the same. If they are not, it's not equal. So it's a definition of an algorithm, right? And that definition should suffice to implement it across every single type you have in your project for most use cases, at least for the like self-value types and everything else. So we can write it once, test it once, all the deal with all the special scenarios, so like being able to skip variables and stuff like that. And then it eases the maintenance cost. So once it's written and you add a new variable or you remove variable, all the boilerplate is automatically updated for you, which is a huge benefit because you don't have to remember about all those different boilerplates, use cases in your project. And it av avoids human mistakes. If you remove a variable from your type, the compiler will tell you that you are trying to compare something that's no longer existing, right? But it doesn't wor work the opposite way. If you add a variable and you forget to update equality or hashing or any other boilerplate, the compiler is silent. You don't know it's there. And this will lead to some really problematic scenarios. And it allows you to experiment with interesting architecture choices because once you remove the cost of maintaining the boilerplate, you can actually come up with a safer code. For example, in Swift, there is, uh, you have typed identifiers, which gain some traction. So rather than having an email as a string, you can have an email as a, like a phantom type, for example. The value is inside of string, but you cannot pass it into something that expects regular strings. And there's a lot of boilerplate around that. Or like if you use protocol composition, that's another use case where you can generate stuff that would be annoying otherwise, but it's actually helpful for your code. And what I want to focus on is avoiding the human mistakes because writing any of that boilerplate is not really a big deal for us, right? It's, it's pretty straightforward. It's simple. But the, the problem isn't writing it. The problem is that when you add new variable, the bugs appear. And I have an actual example of what happens. And people forget to update the boilerplate. And the bugs that this can cause can actually be really hard to track. And they, you usually don't find them in code review. So uh, with New York Times, because calculating height for the text notes is really expensive, like laying out text in iOS especially, it's one of the most um, performance critical parts, especially for like a news app because how do you break the text is it's not easy to calculate like calculating where the images go in like regular cells pretty straightforward but how do you break the text based on different margins and the rules for the typesetting that's actually expensive so what we do is 
we used uh, cell height cache. So once a model has been calculated, like once this displays once, it's stored in cache in case that view appears again, we don't need to recalculate it. So pretty straightforward, a lot of people do something like that. And uh, so I wrote the implementation and I went to an, a conference. I was gone for a week, I come back and a week passes again and I get a bug from the production saying that the cells are cut out. So you have part of the text displayed and then there's something is missing, like the text is not taking the, the, the height it should. So I look at the code, I try to figure out what's happening since it worked two weeks ago. And uh, what happens is we were changing some of the models. So people added a couple of variables to different models in the application. That is actually affecting how the cells are displayed. And what people forgot to do is to update the boilerplate related to hashing and equality. So I need to find which types changed. I need to see all the variables, make sure that every variable is actually handled because it's hard to reproduce, right? This getting a collision on a hash, it's not something that just happens very easily. You actually have to have specific scenario to get the collision. And uh, so I had to manually figure out which variables didn't update correctly. And then I found it and it was missing like one or two variables. I fixed it and it went to production. But this kind of bugs happen for everyone. It doesn't matter who you are, this will happen very often. So we want to avoid this. I never trust programmers, including myself. I don't trust humans because all of us make mistakes. And it doesn't matter if someone is like senior or junior, like you have bad days, you have good days, you have to work on crunches on their tight deadlines, mistakes happen. If we can automate something that a human would otherwise have to maintain, it's always gonna be safer. So what are some of the metaprogramming techniques in Cocoa? What's available by default? So for example, you have the runtime reflection for Objective-C, if you use Objective-C, and you have key-value observing, which, is, which was very powerful, and key-value coding. They come together, and if you use Objective-C before, this, they work really closely together very well. And some of the syntax example is you could set a value on a child variable, or you could uh, add observer for a specific property and get informed, right? That's pretty convenient, and the runtime and reflection of Objective-C is extremely powerful. You can do a lot of stuff with it. The thing is a lot of people are afraid to use it for right reasons because as powerful as it is, it's also very risky. You can make a mistake that will be hard to track and it will cause a lot of problems. And a good example is analytics libraries. They have went a little too far with runtime. A lot of the analytics libraries like Google, for example, swizzle stuff for you without you saying you want it. You just put the library in and suddenly the code paths change. The problem with that is if something goes wrong, you don't know why and you don't understand the code path because you never called this function. It, it's a little risky. So people obviously were afraid. But if you used it correctly in like a very narrow scenario, it could be extremely helpful for us. So. Most metaprogramming in Cocoa is not available if you use pure Swift. If you inherit from NS object, you can use some of those features. If you didn't, you're on your own. Or if you don't interact with Objective-C, not much you can do. So with Swift, the biggest thing they gave us is a reflection system, so mirrors. And they allow you to learn a lot about the type in the runtime. And they are read-only, which means that they are not very useful unless you use them to read data, but actually use runtime to change data. So if you don't have access to Objective-C runtime or key value coding, the mirror is purely read-only. Like it's only information you can read. It's not something you can use to build, for example, a property grid for your application. You cannot read and change those variables. You can only read them. So what's, what's happening in the future in Swift? So when I was creating Sorcery, I talked with Joe Groff, which is a compiler engineer at Apple. And he said that being able to derive equality like Haskell is one of the things he wants to, like the community wants to support. And they did, like the adoption of Sorcery actually pushed them to prioritize this stuff. So we are getting equality and hashing automatic um, 
in Swift 4 and 4.1. Like they're still, I don't think they finished all of the implementations, but they're slowly adding support for more scenarios. And they also want to add a macro system. So um, if you ever use Rust, they have an ability to write like um, abstract syntax tree aware macros. So not like C macros, but actually like part of the language that you could actually debug because like C macros are really hard to work with. So already in Swift 4, we have new key value paths, which you guys probably use already, and deriving equality in Hashable. That's rolled out partially. So we had it for value types. I saw some implementation got merged for enums, but I don't think it's fully completed yet. The thing with this is it's either all or nothing. So there is no way for you to control the generated code. And uh, that means that you cannot fine tune it. If you want to skip a variable for equality, you have to write your own equality. So it's either all variables or it's non -var no, no variables. So it's not ideal. We want to have more. So what are the problems with the metaprogramming? Because this is something we need to talk about. So with a lot of languages, including Objective-C, when you use reflection runtime, it's usually based on strings. No one likes to deal with string type APIs because it's really unsafe. There are no compile time errors. So if you make a runtime, like metaprogramming in Ruby or, well, Ruby cannot really have that, but in you do it in Objective-C, if you find bugs, it will be while the app is running. The compiler won't help you with problems. So it's easy to create bugs that don't surface immediately and they only appear even in production, which is a problem. So inconsistent app state is the worst thing you can create. It's really hard to debug and it's hard to reason about what's happening. That's why the magic part is always, you know, you want to be smart, you don't want to be clever, you want to write code that's easy to reason about, easy to understand, especially when the bugs happen, because like someone said, uh, if you are like if you are really pushing it when you're writing the code, you're really smart about it. How are you gonna debug it? Right, debugging is the harder part. So you want to keep it simple. So do we need to wait for Swift six or whatever to get like those me macros, those metaprogramming features? They have different priorities. We were able to move their priorities a little with like even adoption of sorcery, but. I would like to get build times better before I get metaprogramming, honestly, because there are things we can do as a community, and there are things that has to be done in the language and the compiler itself. And I think everyone would be happy if we could like have 30% faster compile times. So they have a very tedious process to deal with features, and they have higher priorities. So let's talk about sorcery. It's a tool I created because what I what I do is I'm a consultant and I work with multiple clients. And this, the thing I see is a lot of those tasks appear across all the projects I have been involved with. And it's always the same solution. It's always the same kind of code. And it's really annoying to me. Like it's pain-driven development. When I, like all the open source I do is pain-driven development. It really just drives me to hell that we are solving the same stuff in the same way across hundreds of projects and we didn't do anything about it. So that's why I created Sorcery. And Sorcery works by scanning your source code. It builds abstract syntax tree for you, and then it applies your templates to generate more Swift code for you. And this is basically a code generator tool that gets fed your meta types. What's really nice about this is it's an application. It's not a code dependency to your project. So it's not something that will, you know, you, you add some kind of pod and it has like this tone of source code that you would need to analyze to see if it's affecting somehow your app, especially if they use like runtime, it's very risky. So with sourcing, no code dependencies added to your project. It works more like a preprocessor than a framework. And this has a huge benefit. The code that sourcing generates is the code you want it to generate. It's not opinionated. You can have any code style, you can have basically do it. it, it does what you tell it to do. That means that even at some point, if you decide no, you don't want to use this tool anymore, or the tool breaks or whatever, the code that it generated is your code that's part of your process, and you can just maintain it by hand. It's not some magic, it's, it's really clear, it's normal Swift. So what are the templates? 
templates, basically because we have the abstract syntax tree, we need you to be able to express what exactly you want to generate with it. So templates, uh, we have three different languages for templating. We have Stencil, Swift, and Effective JavaScript. Because the architecture is very, like sorcery architecture is very modular. The scanning, the generation are completely separate. It's very easy to add your own language for the templating. And it's always like a balance between how accessible the templating language is versus how complex it is. So an example, Stencil is created by Kyle Fuller. It's a very simple language. It's not Turing complete. Uh, it's one we default to. And the reason we default to is I believe that most of the boilerplate doesn't need complex templating. And usually when you have like very complex templates, you should actually think about it more before you start trying to extract it. So uh, this is good for beginners and for most templates. It's very simple. You just have braces and you just, you can print stuff. Basically, if you ever use HTML templating, that's it. With Swift, it's our own templating language. It's actually real Swift which makes it the slowest templating to use. No surprise there. Uh, basically everything within the markers is compiled as regular Swift. So we just extract the code, we have some helpers for printing, so we just have some, you know, help it converts into like specific output methods. But all of this is composed into a Swift file, and that Swift file just gets run through Swift compiler. So it's if you don't want to learn new language, this is trivial. You only learn the markup and you can use it as, as is. There is no need to learn a special language for sorcery. And this is handy for more complex templates since it's actually full Swift. So you can, do, you can use anything you use in your apps. And effective JavaScript is, if you know JavaScript, you can use it. There is a lot of templating. Uh, it's a very popular templating language and there is a lot of tooling for it. So syntax highlighting and everything else works pretty well. So let's look at some of the features. So it's powered by Apple own source kit. So we don't try to reinvent how, source, uh, how Swift source is scanned. As much as we can use from Apple, we use, and source kit is the, what they use to power Xcode. So we, we leverage that. But they don't care about a lot of the properties. So for example, they don't scan the associated types in enums. So we build some parsers on top of source, what source kit provides so we can give you more information and it generates regular Swift code. There is no runtime involved, it's compiled, and it's fully typed. It is what, it, what you want it to be. So if you have uh, problems with it, like if you make a mistake in your templating language and the implementation is wrong, the compiler will just not compile it because it happens before the Swift uh, gets compiled. No runtime reliance whatsoever. And it, to make it easier to work on it, I created a daemon which allows you to in real time, change the code and observe the changes. And you can use sorcery not just for code generation, but also about analyzing your source code. So for example, here I'm just writing some templates that verify the structure of New York Times project. And as you can see, as I type and I save the file, I get immediate results with information about the types in the project. So it's pretty convenient. The other features that it has, it supports annotations. So something that Apple doesn't do is you cannot fine-tune the equality, right, and or hashing. With Sourcer, you can just add an annotation and say, skip this from persistence, or don't equate this. So you can do a lot of stuff, or you can add JSON keys, for example. So similar how it works in Java, you have attributes, Sourcer supports that. It also supports inline code generation. So other than generating in extension files, there are some parts in your application where you actually want to inject code into your source file. For example, for NS coding, you couldn't do an extension because required initializers have to be defined in the type itself. So with Sorcery, you can just annotate it and it will inject the code to that file automatically. So it's very powerful. So how do you integrate Sorcery? So it, my recommendation is a build fi phase for your project. That build phase happens before the source, co source code gets um, compiled. And it's already distributed with a lot of templating. And when you want to create a new template, use the, the watch mode because it allows you to do it in real time with feedback, which is very convenient. Some of the bundled templates, equality hashing, enum cases and counts, so you, get, you can iterate over enumerations. 
you can implement lenses, mocks for your tests. So rather than manually have to create a stop or a fake object for your protocols, it will do it for you. It can do property level diffing. So when you get the uh, equality test failing, you get the exact difference rather than a wall of text. It can generate Linux main if you work with SPM. It can generate decorators. All of this is bundled. There's actually a couple more bundled with it. You don't need to use them though, like if you don't want to. Like for the diffing, this is the difference. Rather than getting a wall of text that says nothing, you get the exact difference. This is comparing two arrays. So it finds that an index zero in this array has a different property name. So it's much more convenient. So big question is how long does it take? Does it slow down my Swift code even more? And it does not because it, it's much faster to parse because it doesn't have to do the same analysis that Swift compiler does. We scan every file in parallel and there is a last phase is combining the data, which is very efficient. It uh, uses extensive caching. So if your file didn't change, we don't need to rescan it ever. And the cost is negligible in comparison to Swift build times. As you can see, this is running on pretty big code base. It's the New York Times code base, and it takes less than a second. And we have 864 classes, well, types. So it's really fast. And our Swift compile times are like two minutes. So this is nothing. It's not noticeable at all. I'll show you a quick demo of some of the stuff you can do with it. So let's me just change the display mode. Okay. And I already have like a simple project here. And I have Visual Studio Code. And what I'm going to do. I'm going to run the daemon in a terminal. So sor sorcery, basically, you have a YAML file you can define with your common settings. And then you can just do sorcery watch. And it scans the sources. And then I can see, like, if I add a new type to the project, cannot actually decrease this. OK, let's just move this a little. So if I add a new structure, and I just save the file, you can see that the number of types got updated. You can do much more with it. For example, you could do for like, what I like to do is rather than doing it on every type, I like to have marker protocols, which are basically empty protocols that I use in my source code. So I can write a protocol called auto equitable. And what I do is I extend classes with it. And then in the template, what I can do is for type in types implementing, implementing auto equitable. Let me just move this a little. So actually, one second. Mm -hmm. So I do a for loop. I end the loop. And then I do extension type.name, equitable, and I can do static function. And you can see, as I, I just save the file, and it's already starting. So I, if I want, I can enable autosave, and I would see it in real time. I'm just not going to bother. So static function equal, and then I want to have LHS type.name, RHS type.name. And then that function should return bool. And I save the file, and I see it's defined the, the equality function. And what I can do here is I can go for every variable in this type, for variable in types stored variables, then end for. And what I can do is guard lhs dot variable dot name not equal uh, equal. Uh, else return false. Uh, and I messed up something, one sec. For variable in type, not types. 
So I don't have any properties, right? So if I add a variable now, let's say I add let string dot uh, just let name dot string. I immediately get this added here, and I can go further. Obviously, number. So I already have basic equality implemented, very simply. And if I have another another entity like the boo, and I can extend it with auto equality, and I add some variables here, that gets added automatically as well. So it's very powerful. And if you want to, for example, be able, like this is what Swift will do for you with structures, but what Swift doesn't do is it doesn't allow you to skip variables. So if I had a variable here that I didn't care about, like the cache ID or something, or transient, let's just call it transient. So at this point, what happens in Swift, if you use the derived equality, you have to write your own equality function. You cannot use their built-in feature, right? With sorcery, what you can do is, for example, here I can skip variables that are not implement, like skip variables that are not implementing, implementing, ah, implementing. Let's just call it skip equality. Mm -hmm -hmm. Variables for type not. Uh, not annotated, sorry. Annotated. And now what I can do is still here. I can do sorcery, skip equality, and it's gone. So your code gets automatically updated. You just use attributes. And there are much more powerful um, use cases. So for example, this is really simple template. Like the actual equality is more complex because we need to deal with enums with associated values. But even so, like uh, the built-in template, it's like 70 lines of template, like the stencil code, not that complex. And it generates thousands of lines for every project that uses it. So it's, it's really convenient, it's very easy to use. And I mean, you can use it for, for example, like if you use protocol composition, you have structure that contains uh, a dependency. So for example, you have a protocol has network provider, network provider. And in that protocol, you just say that there is a network provider, which is, and then you have to do this for every dependency you want, so that in your source code, you can define dependencies like this, and has something provider. So there's a lot of boilerplate you have to do for like having more strongly typed langu language features. And with Sorcery, you can just create a simple template for every depend, like basically checks if something is a dependency and generates all those boilerplate protocols for you. So there's a lot of use cases. It's, it's crazy how many people, how many ideas people come with. Like there are a couple of libraries on GitHub doing persistence, using SQL, using JSON, like there's, it's it's really powerful, and it doesn't like you see the code I write here. This is my style. I could I can use guards or I could use if with end uh, statements. I could basically whatever I want. I can define. And as you can see, creating new templates, especially with the reflection system, like the in real time, it's amazingly easy. I wish we could write Swift like this. That kind of feedback makes it very simple to learn the templating language, learn the features you have, and tweak your code. So let's go back to the slides. Mm. Okay. So Sorcery is available on GitHub. It's, it has 40 contributors already. There have been, as well, 40 releases. So it's not something that's relying on me. I've actually been hands-off for the last couple of months. And uh, there are three other contrib core contributors that have write access. So it's, it's not relying on me being alive. I can go under the bus. It's still going to work. And uh, the community is very open. Uh, we have a lot of starter issues, and a lot of people are contributing. And there are a lot of other projects based on sorcery. It's already used in 7,000 applications. So pretty crazy, honestly. 
7,000. Last week, they added five, like 500 new apps adopted it. So it's, it's getting really popular. And it allows you to eliminate boilerplate, write code once, test it once, limit human mistakes, and ease maintenance costs, which is huge. And better architecture choices are always useful. If you don't trust me, there are people that really like it. And I could go on. So there is a lot of nice features people are creating. So question time. Does anyone have any questions? We still have a couple of minutes. Have anyone used sorcery already? Hey, not many people. So normally you integrate it as a build phase, and then every time you compile, it just gets rerun. So in uh, in Xcode, you add a build phase script, and uh, you just run sorcery in it. And then every time you build a project, all the boilerplate gets regenerated if it changed. If it didn't change, it doesn't touch the files, so it doesn't deal, it doesn't cause problems for the Xcode caching. Uh, if you work on templates, you run the daemon. So you do what I did in console, you just say sorcery watch, and then it observes the changes. And it actually observes changes in both your source code and the template. So it doesn't matter which one you change, it will rerun it. So it's it's the way you should be creating new templates. Yeah, I run the in in the terminal. In your so in your project you put the YAML file with the configuration and the source code that it generates should be part of your repo. My recommendation is to include it because it's like regular Swift. It's not like some people would uh, not commit sources that are generated, but this is actually source code that gets compiled and run. And I think it should be part of your GitHub uh, because if sorcery breaks for whatever reason, your code will still work. So that's, for me, it's crucial that it's part of your source code. You get a normal diffs. So it will run on every build. But if the code didn't change, it doesn't rewrite it. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, if not, thank you very much. And if anyone has questions after, just come say hi. Thank you.